Hey up and welcome to another episode of Last Cast. Today he joined us back up at Mo Moncton Pools today and we've actually done a bit of filming already. We've done a bit of shallow fishing with hard pellets and pellet fishing on the deck as well. So we've decided, being that we've sort of come to the conclusion of that session, that we're going to do a bit of paste fishing just beneath where we've been feeding that area. We've seen plenty of fizzing, so there's plenty of fish in the area. But one thing that I will note is that we've covered paste fishing before. Something we've actually done at, on Cyprio Lake here about a year or so ago. We've also done a more comprehensive video at Sunrise Lake, so there'll be a link in the description if you want to check that out, where we we'll basically run through all this various different types of paste, how to fish it on the pole, the running line, and also down the edge as well. Um, but we've come here today basically to just fish it for an hour and try and get a few better stamped fish. When we're at sunrise, we've had a few issues with catching a lot of F1s, um, and as I say, it's not really what we were after there. We we're looking for a few decent stamped carp and barbel, but unfortunately it didn't happen. So we've come here today just to sort of recap it for an hour or so, and like I say, try and get a few decent carp on the bank. In terms of what we've, we're doing, the plumbing up and the bait prep and all that kind of stuff, we've done it already. And there's a couple of videos on Bobble TV too, if you want to check those out, which will run through each of those aspects of paste fishing. But as I say, we're just going to quickly run through it today and hopefully get a good hour in and put a few fish on the bank. In terms of the rig that we're going to use today, as I say, it's plumbed up at 13 metres um, and it's basically a Frenzy FP 200 float. It's the same rig effectively that you'll see us use at sunrise. Um, with a paste pot on the end there, as you can see, mounts a decent length back, double eight elastic in the top end, 019 main line with three number eight back shot, which when the wind's like this are essential to having the rig. As I say, Frenzy FP 900 paste float. Um, the, the idea behind these, as you can see, nice long bristle, but I choose these, I think they're a discontinued pattern now, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, they're aligned through body design, so incredibly strong, but also because the, uh, the actual stem of the float runs halfway up the bristle, so essentially preventing the, the float um, collapsing and the, the bristle folding over if you do foul hook fish. So something to look for when you do choose a paste float is either a fully in line pattern where the, the uh, line runs off the top of the bristle or something where the bristle's reinforced. So that's one thing to look at. Dead simple float as you can see, only 0.2 in shotting capacity because we're fishing in say about three foot of water, something like that. In terms of the main line, or what's on the main line I should say, just got two number 10 stots down the rig just to stabilise it. Um, quite often when it's really shallow you can get away with no shots on the line, but I like to have just a couple on there just to keep the rig nice and stable. As you can see those are set at half depth, and then that just comes down to a 6 inch hook length of 017 power line to a size 12 Kamsan animal hook, a nice big wide gape hook uh, with a nice heavy wire gauge that's going to bind to the paste nicely. So. It's a dead simple rig. As I say, we've covered this before, so if you check out the previous video for more detail on how we go about using the rig and the various reasons about it, there's no point in us really recapping that today, um, other than just saying, as I say, about the back shot and how we've plumbed up. In terms of plumbing up the rig, dead simple. Um, one thing that I always make a note of when you're paste fishing is using two plummets, a 10 and a 30 gram plummet. Again, we'll cover this in the video that you'll see on Bobble TV too, but the crux of it basically is a 30 gram plummet will give you a true reading of what the bottom's like in terms of what it's made up of, whether it's silty, whether it's rocky. And if it is silty, it'll tell you how deep the silt actually is. Then using a 10 gram plummet that's going to sit on top of the silt, it'll be able to tell you exactly how the float should sit when you're actually fishing during the, the session. So like I say, that's the crux of plumbing up, dead simple. So find out the depth of the silt and what you're actually fishing on using a 30 gram Looking for a nice flat area as well is another really important factor when you're paste fishing, especially in open water like today. And then using a 10 gram to sort of imitate the paste and get that to give you a reading of how the float should sit when you're fishing. As I say, that's all explained in another video that we'll link, um, link you to. And that's basically, in terms of the bait, dead simple. All I've got is some 6mm hard pellets, as I say, that we've been using today and some green swim stim that I've just mixed up into a paste. Again. We've run through that in a previous video, so we'll put you a link to that. But basically the principle between mixing up, mixing up paste is adding the ground bait to the water rather than the other way around until you achieve a consistency that you're happy with. So I say with everything looked at there, we'll crack on with the fishing. As I say, I've plumbed up the rig, I've fed the area, but I'm going to put another pot full of pellets in just to create a bit more activity on the bottom and get the fish focused down there. And hopefully we'll be able to put a few fish on the bank and ideally this time around what we'll try and explain is basically how the float behaves in the peg and try and show you how proper bites from big carp um, should be on the paste so as i say we'll turn around on the box get a bit of bait in the peg and then show you how we go about fishing the paste right so as i say i'm going to kick off the peg now with a decent pot full of six mil pellets and also put in just a couple of little nuggets of the paste as well just as a sort of sample hook bait again 
depending where you're fishing or where I'm fishing, I'll feed different um, baits. Like say at sunrise, I look to put down a bed of feed and try and attract skimmers, big bream, and a variety of fish. Whereas today, I'm only really able to use what's in front of me on the uh, on the side tray that we've got with us. But I'm just putting in a decent quantity of feed just to get the fish settled into the area that I want to fish. Again, any sort of hard pellets will do. But the most important thing is trying to feed something that is more selective to try and get the carp in the peg rather than sort of attracting lots of, especially if there's lots of small skimmers, small roach, things like that. You want to try and put in baits that are going to sort of weed those out and make sure that you're only really getting carp in the peg, especially on a venue like this. So I'm just going to line up with a far bank marker, again got a marker on my pole, and just deposit that bait down there like so. In some cases, as I say, I'll spread it around a bit, um, try to create a big bed of feed, but today, because we've already been feeding and fishing that area, there should already be a few fish there, so I'm just trying to make sure that they're concentrated on the bottom in that area of the peg. So we'll get the cupping kit back and hopefully while we're explaining a couple of things about the rig and the positioning of the pole pot, that peg will start to fizz and that's where paste really comes into, into its own in an area of a peg like this where it's absolutely uniform in depth and really silty. Paste really sorts out a lot of the fish in terms of when you're sort of fishing hard pellets there, you can foul hook a few fish or run the risk of it, especially when you get too many fish in your peg, whereas paste is the opposite you'll end up getting a lot more bites when you're getting much more activity in your peg because you're using a really positive rig, a big bait, it does sort out the bites and basically means that you're not faffing around missing bites so much. So what I'm going to do is just pick up the rig, quickly get a bit of paste on the hook. What you'll see if you see that link into how we, how we go about plumbing up is I plumb up to dead depth as to how the float should sit with the paste on, so i.e. with the hook point or the bend of the hook touching the bottom. So what I like to do when I'm actually forming the paste around the hook is I like to get a decent ball, sort of a bit smaller than a golf ball, say a conker size, something like that, and flatten it out. What I'll actually do is almost lay the, the line through the, the, uh, the paste, a bit of an exaggeration there, and fold the paste round the line. Then as you can see, the hook point should sit proud at the bottom. Then all I'll do is flatten the bottom of the paste out so it acts almost like a plummet and then just form the paste round like so and you'll see a little shiny mark there of the hook being right in the bottom of the paste and that makes sure that you're fishing as you're plumbed up, i.e. it's pretty much imitating the plummet and vice versa. So it's just a case of popping that in the pole pot and then shipping out to your required mark. One thing that I should have done, um, which I haven't just yet, is put a bowl of water next to me. Again, the last thing you want is ground bait all over your pole, so if you can do, have a bowl of water next to you just so you can wash your hands when you're shipping out because the last thing you want is that paste jumping out of the pot as you're work, working your way out to say 13 metres like we are today. One thing that you'll notice as well is just how that rig hangs as well. Especially when I'm fishing somewhere like this that's a bit more shallow, I like to have the float pretty much at the bottom of the rig with using the back shot and the two number 10 shot to stabilise the rig as it's shipping out, stop it twisting round. Again, a bit of trial and error to work out how that works in relation to how far the pole pot sits down the top kit but again it's basically about creating a level of separation and stability so when you're shipping out the pole float doesn't twist and tangle so when you get to your mark and you tip the pole pot the, uh, the pole pot over and the paste out the last thing you want is that float to sit at a funny angle because it's wrapped round because ultimately that just wastes time in shipping back and not getting the rig presented correctly so again, being really nice and careful to ship out. And again, on somewhere like this where we're having to double unship, that the most important thing is getting your roller position right. So just taking my time to ship out to the mark. And what I use is the markers on my pole to tell me how far past I need to basically be to put the, the uh, to turn the pole pot over so I'm fishing directly underneath my pole tip. So I'm fishing at a marker on the pole and then I just need to ship past to another mark just to tip that pull, the, uh, the paste, sorry, into the peg. Right, it's just going to deposit the paste into the peg like so and wait for the float to register. You'll see it'll follow the paste down and sit up properly. And that's a bite, really sharp indication of the fish on straight away. 
See, that was almost immediate as that paste hit bottom, and those really sharp bites are what you're looking for to hit. Again, didn't get enough time really to explain what was going on there, but you'll be able to see on camera how sharp that bite was. And that's basically where the fish has just sucked in the bait and the hook and given a really sharp bite. If the float sort of drags under, that's when the fish has, has pretty much swum into the line and sort of picked it up on its pectoral or whatever it might be. And the last thing you want to be doing is striking at those bites because with a big hook, that's when you'll often foul hook fish. And especially with decent sized carp, there's plenty of tail and fin and rest of the body to hook as well. So what you want to be looking for is those really sharp sort of 100 mile an hour bites, if you like to describe them as that, where the float just absolutely shoots under. And that's when the fish is on just a, a decent lift and you should set the hook every single time. Again, you will miss the odd bite with paste, but it's no bad thing because effectively when you do strike the hook or the paste off the hook, if you like, then you're pretty much feeding the peg for the next fish. So they go down there, pick up a piece of paste and they gain a bit of confidence that way. So it's no bad thing. But if you are missing lots of bites, one thing you can try to do, and as I say at that video at sunrise, you'll see, is added a little bit more to the depth. Just give yourself a bit more bristle to read what's going on. Again, as long as you make sure that, and that's one of the main reasons why I make sure the float's undershotted, is that you'll actually see some of the body when the paste pops off. So if it comes to it, you can pretty much fish with, with a full bristle. Personally, I like to fish between sort of half and three quarters for proper carp. And I find that to be absolutely perfect. You can see the fish here really putting up a good account of themselves. Again, not massive fish in this lake, as opposed to Cyprio, which you've seen us do a paste video on before. But a decent stamp of fish. And these are what we were really after when we fished at sunrise. See, hooked right in the corner of the mouth. Perfect hook hold and he's never coming off. So I'll just try and pop the hook out here. We'll see if we can hold him up for camera. Again, shows how confidently they're taking the bait when they have the hook sort of well down in the mouth like that. So again, not a massive fish, but we're already off the mark within sort of five minutes of that paste going in. Lovely little mirror carp, probably a couple of pounds, maybe a bit less. As I say, a cracking little fish to start with. Again, like I've said, today's video really we're looking to try and describe the bites a bit better than we were able to do at Sunrise Lakes. So hopefully there it's given you a bit of an idea of how the float should behave. Again, wasn't in for very long before it buried. But that really sharp bite is what you're looking for basically. So we'll get back out there and hopefully we'll get another one fairly quickly. Again, if we're getting bites that quick, there's definitely one or two fish in the peg. So one thing you can do is just wet your fingers before you actually start picking up the paste. What it'll tend to do is stop the paste sticking to your fingers, so it makes it a bit easy to work with. Especially today where I'm fishing a bit further out, I'm fishing a slightly stiffer, stiffer mix than I usually would because I would expect quite a few decent fish to be in the peg, so I don't want the hook to pull out the paste too soon. I want to get as long out there as I possibly can. If I was fishing a lot closer in, then I would tend to fish a softer paste, but because I'm fishing at 13 metres today, I don't want to be in and out all the time because it is quite a time-consuming process. And one thing I will note as well today is I'm not going to look to put any loose, more loose feeding if I can avoid it. Although we are fishing fairly late on in the day, so the fish will feed naturally more aggressively, I wouldn't try to tend to put too much bait in 
once I've started catching on the paste, I do like to effectively fish it almost as a self-feeding method. Because once the carp really get honed in onto it, then the last thing you want to be doing is getting them preoccupied with smaller particles like pellets or corn or whatever it might be. So again, you can see that floats now registering the paste. And we're just waiting now for a really sharp bite. Occasionally, if there's a lot of silvers in the peg, you'll get a lot of sort of little dips like that. Little movements where fish are brushing into the line. And it's important that you don't strike at those. This is what I was saying about leaving plenty of bristle to sort of read the bite. As you can see there, there's the odd carp in the peg as well. And that really sharp pull under is what you're looking for. So even though the, the float actually came back up, it's where the fish has sucked in the bait and freed the hook from the paste. And that's what we're looking for. You'll see the float sort of moved a couple of times before that went under. But that really sharp pull, that's what you're looking to strike at. Again, it's not easy sometimes, especially like when we're fishing up at sunrise, you can very quickly get sort of suckered into striking at bites that you shouldn't really be striking at. Especially when you get used to fishing pellets and stuff like that, where you're hitting every little indication paste. It's like the complete opposite of that. You're waiting for that specific type of bite. Otherwise, you're just going to end up foul hooking fish. Let's get another decent stamp carp. It just shows how little time it requires for the paste to be in the peg before you get a bite. As I say, we're fishing in sort of towards the evening now, so it's obviously the best time to fish it. But it's a fantastic method once you start catching on paste. Very often you can catch on it for several hours. Say so because there's a lot of competition for that one small amount of feed. And as it does break down, there's plenty of attractant in it, especially when you're using something like green swim stim. See every fish that we've caught today on the video that we were filming prior and like now they're really fighting incredibly hard because they've had the aerators on and the water temperatures are nice and high. And there we go, that's another one in the bag. Again, similar stamp to the last one and nailed right in the top lip. Again, lovely fish. See. Don't want to hold him up too much because they are very lively but again another couple of pounds in the net so we'll get him slipped back and pace fishing really is as simple as that once you get your rigs right and plumb up correctly and get your feeding right it is just a case of repeating this process shipping out and putting a bit more bait in the peg every time and as I say it will eventually become a self-feeding thing that initial feed should in most cases last you for the duration of the match because you keep topping up every time you put a little block of paste in so again just moulding it round the, the line pulling the hook into the bottom of the paste then just flattening it out. As I say, that's the perfect way in my book anyway to present paste. Occasionally, because you, do, you are using quite large pots like this, you could put some six mil pellets in there, but as I say, ideally, I like to just feed the paste as it is, just to try and sort of mitigate the effects of skimmers and other small nuisance fish that could smash the paste off the hook. So again, just getting to the marker, depositing the paste into the peg, and where possible, just drag that, that float back above the paste where it's gone if, in, if you can. Sometimes when it's really shallow, it's impossible to do that, but what it does is means that the, the line's not effectively dragging, or sorry, the, the float's not dragging across 
towards the paste, it's just going to set itself directly above it. And what that'll often mean is you're not getting those false indications straight away. The fish having a go at it all the while now, as you can see. And that's a line bite there, so I don't want to be striking at that. You see how the float's just gradually moved away. I think a small fish might actually have hold of that. But that line bite there, if I'd have struck at it, put the section back on. See, I've just lifted the rig clear of that fish. Could well have been a carp actually that had just about foul hooked itself. If I'd have actually struck there, then I'd have hooked that fish. And as I say, that'd have been a bit of a nightmare, especially fishing up against a far bank and foul hooking a fish with a size 12. You're not going to pull out of them easily. So that could have resulted in a bust float or, or worse. So as I say, because as I explained there, I could see the way the float went down. It's not a bite that I want to be striking at, so it's just a case of leaving that and then waiting, like in that case, for the fish to just swim off. Again, because I didn't strike as well, what it also means is I've not spooked that fish. It'll have felt the line, but it'll probably come back. So, as I say, hopefully in these past few minutes with the first couple of fish and that, hopefully it's given us a good chance to uh, explain to you what kind of bites you're looking for on the paste. Because with paste fishing I've found in the past, and it's one of the hardest things to learn is, is what to strike at. But a line bite like that, definitely have to leave them. Even though the float might go under and stay under for a, a period of time like that and reappear down the peg, you've got to try and understand that that's a fish that's pushed into the line, picked up the, the line or the hook length on its say, pectoral fin, and has kept on swimming and that's why the, the line's just following that fish. If you strike then it's going to set that hook into the fish, whereas if you just leave it to swim away like that, the hook will simply just fall away from the fish. Because all that's happened there is he's swum through the line, picked up the hook and pulled the hook out the paste and has started to move off with it. So again, hopefully that makes sense as to what's going on and how to read the bites. And again, that's why you want to leave plenty of bristle showing. And again, there's no harm in stuff like that happening because obviously that's just left another little nugget to paste down there the fish can happily just graze over. So again, it's just like, like topping up the peg, if you like. So that pace might have just rolled a little bit. Again, you can see that float's moving sideways now. That's where, again, a fish has just picked up the, the line on his fin. And float's dotted down a little more than I'd like there. Could well have just had that pace roll into a slightly deeper patch of water. But again, another sharp little indication, and that's a fish on. Again, at face value, the bites do seem to be a bit funny because you'll see the float sort of go under and reappear. But as soon as you get a sharp indication like that, that's what you've got to strike at. It doesn't feel like a particularly big fish, this. Yeah, much smaller fish, but again, you'll see that he's hooked in the mouth. And as I keep trying to reiterate, this is one of the harder things to learn with paste fishing. Is that sharp bite is where the fish has actually sucked in the bait and given you the bite. Anything slower than sort of flying under bites, then you don't want to be striking at them. Get much smaller fish that time. And the hook's just dropped out in the net. Again, another fish, I'd say probably about half a pound to a pound or so. So get him pop back, pop back and hopefully we'll catch something a little bit bigger. Again, you could see though on that, that drop in there, the pace didn't quite register properly, um, or ideally, that's how I'd like it. 
the float was dotted down just a little bit too much but again that's why you go for these thick bristle paste floats there's still enough buoyancy there to distinguish between line bites and proper bites So exactly the same process, just putting a decent sized piece of paste in, washing your hands, and then just looking to get back out to the marker. Again, one of the only ways that you're ever going to get good at paste fishing is just through practice. As I say, it took me quite a while to suss out what I needed to do with the rigs. And in terms of actually bait presentation to make sure I was happy with what I was striking at. So it can be one of the most frustrating methods when you're not used to it and it is quite new to you. And it's not something I tend to fish a lot, to be honest. But just with a bit of practice and trying to suss out what the rig's doing and trying to understand what's going on under the water, you can end up turning those sort of funny bites into fish and sussing out what you need to be striking at and what you don't need to be striking at. Again, one mass massive thing that I will point out with this rig, that again, I covered in the Sunrise video, is using those three number eight back shot, really nice heavy back shot. And I like to use those to stop the float sitting sideways in the peg, especially when there's a bit of a wind on it today or there's a bit of tow. So when these back shot will really come into play to stabilize the rig. It doesn't mean that the float sits slightly lower though. It's obviously the resistance on the, the rig that's pulling the float back towards me. One thing you'll see there, that float's absolutely buried and there's another fish on. I'm just going to say there, the float just popped up a little bit and that's where a fish has just nudged into the paste and moved the hook within it. Again, the body of the float wasn't showing, so I knew there was still the paste on, but it wasn't quite set correctly. Then it absolutely buried and that's quite often the case. Sometimes the float will sit a bit, a bit funny, like I say, where a fish has disturbed the paste, maybe it's made it roll down a shelf a little bit or um, pushed it along, or in that case where it's made the hook just sort of sit in the top of the paste, giving a bit more bristle showing like that, you can still then be able to identify that you're waiting for that positive indication there's still paste on. If there wasn't any, then the float will just sit pretty much sort of at a really funny angle in the water. Again, that's another nice fish. like a little common this time, and he's in the net. And interesting, what I was saying there about the fish dislodging the, the hook in the paste is the hook's dropped out in the net, so he must have been very lightly hooked. Again, only a small fish going absolutely ballistic in the net, so I don't think we'll take him out, but we'll get him released. But what I was saying there is, I say I was pretty much released the hook within the paste a little bit, so where he's just slurped in a bit more paste, the hook's gone straight in and hooked him very lightly. As I say, that pretty much tells you what sort of um, what the paste has been doing down there, really. So quite often it'd be very easy to look at the way the float was sitting there before it buried and say that the paste was off. But like I keep saying, when the, the float sat and the body's not showing, then you know there's at least still some bait on and the hook is somewhere within that block of paste. So it's still good for a bite. So I think what we'll try and do is catch one or two more fish before we wrap it up. As I say, it's only been a short little video today. Sort of go over a couple of things with paste fishing and try and sort of build on what we've done up at sunrise and show you basically more how to read the float, if anything. But in the process, we've sort of re recovered a couple of little things that we mentioned in those previous videos where it's a bit more comprehensive. So again, if you're the first, if you're watching this episode about pace fishing first, go and check those two out. And also the little hints and tips on Bobble TV too, just to give you a bit more information about pace fishing and sort of, especially like the plumbing up and the choice of baits and whereabouts to fish in the peg. But like I say, we'll try and get one or two more fish on this before we wrap up the, the, uh, the session and the video.
Right, so as you can see now, the paste is in the peg. And one thing you can do, especially if you mix your paste fairly stodgy, is you can actually tease that float up and try to give yourself a little bit more bristle when it's actually in the peg. See, it could be a useful thing to do now. So sort of making tweaks to the rig as it's actually fishing, rather than having to ship back and move the float up. It's quite often what will happen, another indication there, you can see the fish are right up in the water, is the fish will actually burrow into the silt, especially on very soft bottoms that you're fishing on, and effectively make the peg deeper as, as the session goes on, and I think that's what's happening here. So what I'm going to do is just add another couple of mil to the, the depth, and allow myself a bit more bristle, because especially in the area of the peg where I've been fishing all day, the fish will have churned up the bottom there, like I say, I think that's probably made the bottom really soft there and it's effectively allowing the peg to get deeper as the session goes on. So that's one thing that you do have to be aware of when you are paste fishing. So again, just flattening that paste out in my hand rolling the line into the middle of it, flattening out the bo bottom of the paste like so, then just pulling the hook into the, the paste just to make sure it's nice and secure. I think being that time's wearing on a little bit today, we'll probably just try and catch one more fish rather than the two that I said earlier. So if we can get another one, we'll probably conclude at that. As I say, we didn't want to, it's not sort of a full episode where we're going to go to do, to do sort of a full tutorial because it's something we've already covered. But we just wanted to sort of recap about the sort of different types of bites that you're going to get on paste and just basically show how it works when you're fishing purely for carp like we are today. Right, so as you can see now, the float's still dipping and weaving all the time. And as I keep saying, it's just a case of now waiting for that really quick bite that tells me that there's a fish on. There's plenty of plucks and indications that there's fish around the paste. Just waiting for that float to absolutely bury. Again, it's a bit frustrating, but the way you've got to think about it is like method feeder fishing almost, just pretty much sitting on your hands. And that one's just picked it up. It's pretty much hooked itself there. Again, as you can see, they're going absolutely ballistic, these fish. Not quite the bite that we were hopefully going to end on and explain but just to try and sort of explain what's happened there, because as I say, we're fishing in quite a shallow peg. We've had a couple of issues with fish coming up off the bottom and slamming into the float and line. I think what's happened there, the fish has picked up the bait and gone off with it at quite a, a speed. So rather than the float sort of slowly moving away, like in a proper line bite, what's happened there, the float's popped up and started to move away really quick. So again, sometimes when it's like that, it's a bit 50-50 whether a fish is swimming to the line at quite a high speed, but doesn't tend to happen. Or in the case like this, the fish has actually picked up that bit of paste and swum off with it. Again, rather than actually sitting directly over the feed and sucking in the paste that way. But like I've said, we'll call this one the last fish of the session, I think. Because for me, any, for me anyway, I think we've covered everything we needed to in the previous videos about paste fishing. And today's just been a case of recapping over the bits that we might have missed in terms of, like I say, hitting bites and explaining basically what's going on with the float in the peg. See this float, this fish is going absolutely mad. Again, not a big fish. But these are the stand that you're after when you're fishing paste on a venue such as this. Again, on some of the other lakes on the complex like Cyprio, you'd be looking for sort of eight to 10 pounders on the paste. Whereas here the average stamp's three or four pounds. And the ones that we've had at the moment have been a little bit smaller than that, probably a couple of pound a piece. But again, looked right in the mouth, 
and crucially, the time that we've been fishing today for all about an hour or so, not a single fish with foul hooked. And that's the main thing with pace fishing is avoiding those foul hookers. So it's right in the corner of the mouth. Again, not a massive fish, but a decent stamp to be catching on the pace. So we'll get him popped back and conclude the session at that. So like I've said, hopefully the things that we've covered again in this, uh, this video about pace fishing will help you in, in your fishing with regards to this method. Again, it's not something I do a lot of, but as I say, hopefully by covering, sort of watching this video, which covers basically reading the float, reading the bites and just general fishing of the paste, and looking at our other couple of videos and equally the few hints and tips on Bobble TV too, you should basically get a good idea of how to go about fishing paste. And as I say, ultimately foul hook less fish and put more fish in the net. So as always from Last Cast, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you on that next episode.